So, cool. Anyway, I'll try to speak like that. So, my name is Eugene. I'm, I'm from BPFL. I'm Martin Odersky's PhD student, and uh, macros are my uh, candidacy research. Uh, so, today we will take a look at an interesting question, I'd say a fundamental question. Uh, what, what macros are good for? Th there's a lot of information currently on the web, right? Maybe you've heard of Macro Paradise, maybe you've seen my Scala Days talk. And there are some blogs, people doing like cool stuff. But it, it's not immediately uh, obvious how to apply it to, well, if you, if you use Scala to 10, then you have macros. And probably you might, you might have been wondering, OK, I have macros, now what? How can I use them? And uh, this talk, it, it will answer this question. So, and just, just without further ado, I, I, can, I can tell you the answer. What are they good for? And they're good for, OK, probably this would be the most natural way. OK. And they're good for co code generation? No, this is not good for it. OK. OK. Let me, OK, like that. So code generation, static checks, and DSLs. So as simple as that, and uh, well, the rest 50 minutes I'll spend elaborating on, on this. But before proceeding, uh, let's let's just uh, take a quick look at uh, well, at what macros are, just for those of us who, who are not yet familiar with that. That would be quite quick. So macros, they are a new experimental feature in 2.10. Well, and they're going to stay in 2.11, also as an experimental feature. And it allow, they allow you to write functions executed by Scala compiler. And these functions are written against special API, compiler API, that we call reflection API. Yeah, that's, uh, that's not a, a mistake. That's not a coincidence. It's indeed a reflection API uh, in a sense that we know it from Java or C Sharp. But in our case, we actually share reflection between compile time that is the compiler API, and runtime. Well, just as you know it from Java. <coughs> so uh, in, in uh, what exactly way can you interact with the compiler? Compiler is, is uh, a really big thing, and it can do a lot of things, and it can be interesting to modify a lot of its behaviors. And this gives rise to, to different macro flavors. So maybe you've heard of macro paradise, and type macros, annotation macros, lots of stuff, right? But if we are talking about what you can do with 2.10, with thing that's, that's already in your hands, right? Uh, that would be only def macros. And def macros, that will be the only thing that we're going to talk about today. So at Scala Days, I spend a fair, fair amount of time elaborating on future features. Uh, but today, this is not the case. Today, we will take a look at how you can immediately make use of macros and in which situations you can do that. So def macros. Def macros, they uh, replace method invocations with uh, something else. And uh, what, what, what exactly is this something else? That's, uh, that's up for you to decide. So you can do arbitrary computations inside the macro. Oh, well, I shouldn't get ahead of myself. So in this call, where we have a log, OK, a log is a macro. And what, what does this mean? This means that when the compiler sees an invocation of this macro, it looks up an associated function that we wrote. Remember, I promised a function written against reflection API that hooks in, into the compiler. Well, it's, it's the one. And then it takes this function and it gives, uh, gives it the argument that we see here. So error does not compute. But this will not be the arguments that we're accustomed uh, to, just Java objects. They will be abstract syntax trees that represent snippets of code. And then you can take this code, and then you can generate more code from it. So that's essentially the only thing that macros do. They just take code and generate more code. OK, pretty simple. And now let's, uh, let's see how it works in practice. So let's just see a possible implementation for this macro. So first of all, it all starts with a signature. And as usual, uh, as usual in Scala, when you write function signatures, your experience uh, applies here for macros. So a signature of a macro is uh, of a macro def or a def macro. It's the same as a signature of a regular function. And the uh, interesting things, they begin on the right-hand side. So here, when I say equals macro something, it actually means that we were associating this macro signature with the meta program that they mentioned before, something that will manipulate Scala code, that will hook into the compiler. And this meta program takes the ISTs that, uh, that I told you about. 
So these experts, they're actually thin wrappers over ASTs. And then, when you have ASTs, you can just uh, throw them together using Reify. So with Reify, you just ta take code templates, and uh, these templates uh, might possibly contain holes, and then you, you put uh, some concrete arguments into those holes. So here we, we see a static template, so because we know what we are going to transform our code to, and then we insert the arguments into that template. As simple as that. And uh, probably you guys here who, who know a bit about Macro Paradise and the latest developments, for instance, the feature that went into, into 2.11 M4, released a few days ago, you might ask, oh, oh my god, Eugene, why are, why are you are not using quasi-codes? Because, well, refi, it sucks, right? But, well, as I, as I promised, I, I, won't, I won't get into future features today. So quasi-codes are really cool. Uh, they have a very good way of, uh, of composing code, which is important for macros, because that's what they do. But they're not into, in uh, 2.10. There's some obscure way of getting, uh, getting quasi-codes in your programs for 2.10. And if you're interested, you can Google for Macro Paradise 2.10.x. But I, I won't bother you with these details now. So just, uh, just to summarize, here's what we're going uh, to operate with to, uh, right now. So we have something which does local code transformations. So it's not possible to, to write a macro which somehow implicitly gets uh, execute it and it sees the entire program, it, it transforms it, that would be wonderful. I'm not against that. But, well, this, uh, this is not what dev macros are for. So we have this uh, tiny little feature that's nicely integrated into the language, and uh, what can we do with that? So as I mentioned before, code generation, static checks, and DSLs. And now we will take a look at the details, what this entails. So first of all, code generation. and. Uh, uh, a very good example of code generation is performance. Uh, so here we see this uh, uh, cute uh, generic code that creates an array and fills it in with some predefined value. And Scala is uh, particularly powerful in this regard, in the sense that it's easy to write generic, beautiful code. Uh, but the problem is that uh, it often entails performance problems. So here in, the, in, the, in, the, in this example, because of erasure, uh, well, when we try to fill an array with integers, integers will be boxed, and this will degrade performance significantly. So how can we fix that? Well, there's already a solution for that in Scala called specialization. Oops. So we can pull, uh, put a specialized annotation on the type parameter. And what it will tell the compiler, we have an entire compiler phase dedicated to that. It would tell it to, to generate specialized versions of this method to essentially take, uh, take this method and copy it multiple times, nine times, ten times. Because we have, yeah, right, we have nine, nine, nine primitives on the JVM plus any ref, aka object. So for instance, when I will call create array with an array of int, uh, with uh, t equals int, then it will use the copy of method that it created and specialized for integers. That's all cool, but uh, it has some, some shortcomings. I don't see the slides, but I imagine that I wrote that this is viral viral in the sense that, well, if you, if you have a huge chain, chain of calls in your program, then you need to specialize the entire chain. Because if just a single method will be generic, if, uh, if the type argument is going to be erased, and, uh, it's, uh, and the arguments of, the, of those, uh, this method are going to be boxed, yeah, it all blows up. I mean, you, you lose performance even if every, you, you specialized everything. Except of one small thing, it, it yeah it will it will be a problem. And the second uh, arguably bad thing about specialization, so it's hard to say uh, in in black and white terms because well everything has its, its trade-offs. So one thing that uh, uh, one prominent thing about specialization is that it copy pastes the code essentially. And if you have uh, one type parameter, it will be ten copies of this method. And if you have two type parameters, it will be 100 copies. And well, you can do the maths. So that's the problem. So what essentially we want to do here is, uh, is we want to just take a small, tiny piece of code that we want to specialize here, creation of an array. I mean, uh, uh, the, uh, the line of code where we fill this array in, and uh, to just specialize that small part so that we don't duplicate the code that we don't need. 
Okay, so this is what we want to do, and this is what uh, my colleagues from EPFL, Vlad Ureki and uh, Nikolaj Stuki, uh, did in their recent paper. You can read the paper at the Scala workshop site. So if you Google for Scala workshop 2013, you'll most possibly be able to find it. Or you can follow the link of the presentation. I will post it in my Twitter later. So the thing is that, that you can do this transformation, and apparently it doesn't, it doesn't bring a lot of uh, performance degradation. So here we, we just uh, dispatch some runtime information about T that we know, and, uh, and well, and, and there we get uh, fully specialized code, so optimal performance. But of course we don't want to write this by hand, and here's where macros shine, because remember macros can generate code, right? What can be easier? But you just write this. So here, uh, from now on, I, I will write uh, macros and macro-related parts in the code in blue so that you can easily recognize them. So here we have this specialized macro that's defined using a simple signature. And uh, look, it, it's nice to, to, have, uh, to have macros look like normal functions because they have signatures that people actually understand. So what, what we see here is that we have some, some function that takes a by name parameter, right? This is quite familiar to you as Scala programmers. And now we know, OK, we, we take this, uh, this body, this logic, and we somehow execute it. So we, we, can, uh, we can at least have some approximation of what macro, macros do. So I think it's quite nice that they look like normal functions. And then we, we just use this function. And uh, the code that we've seen here, it gets generated uh, automatically. Well, that's quite nice. And uh, people have gotten pretty impressive performance speed ups thanks to that. Well, that's, that's not surprising because when you use macros, it's as if you, you, you write this code yourself. So you write pretty code, it becomes fast. And uh, there are quite some examples of uh, situations where this technique works. For instance, you, you can transform for loops into while loops, while Java loops that, that will be as fast uh, as, as Java equivalents and that won't create closures so that they will have optim optimal performance, stuff like that. The only thing that I would like to mention that these kinds of macros, uh, they're sometimes not easy to write because of the problems that I won't, uh, won't get into during the presentation. So this, uh, this, ex this is expected to become better because, well, we've, we've just got this macro feature in 2.10 and, of course, it has rough edges. So, well, yeah, this, this, uh, this will become better, but I won't focus on that in, in this talk. And the bottom line is that if you have uh, some problems with macros, you can always ask me. Well, you can write an email directly to me or to Scala internals or to Scala user. I monitor mailing lists. All right. So I think now we've done with the performance, and let's see other usages for code generation that macros can provide. OK. Type classes. Uh, those of you who have been at uh, the advanced track talks today, uh, you, you've seen these uh, type classes, right? And uh, well, type classes, uh, they just, just a quick recap, they represent a pattern of organizing code uh, in a particularly modular and extensible way. So imagine that we have some generic function, and in this case, it's deserialization that depends on T. Well, sure, you, you want to deserialize things differently depending on their type. And, uh, and then we can structure it as follows. We move the, uh, the logic that varies uh, so here it will be the logic that reads something from JSON that parses JSON looks up fields and field and instantiates the type and stuff like that. We move it into a separate trait, okay? And uh, then we use uh, uh, implicits to to tie this uh, uh, to integrate this into a coherent scheme. So in the example below, you can see how how it all works. So imagine that we want to to deserialize an integer. Then we say, OK, so we, we define an implicit value that provides this deserialization strategy. And we say that it's implicit. And then uh, since, uh, oops, yeah, it's a, it's a here. And then in our from JSON function, we have an implicit parameter. And Scala compiler is smart enough to figure out that, OK, we have an implicit value of type reads of int, and we have a, an implicit parameter of this type. Oh, cool. Yeah, this works out. But if, for instance, we would try to deserialize a string, it wouldn't work because it doesn't have an implicit instance. So yeah, this is, this is all uh, really wonderful. And uh, this gives rise to to very extensible style of programming. Because you, you are not, uh, unlike with interfaces, say, you, you can, uh, 
you can take s some pre-existing class, okay, and you can provide an implementation of this deserializer in your own program. So you don't have to, to ask the author of that library to implement serializable interface. You can just define an implicit instance yourself and then use it. And also there are other nice things that this technique composes. So for instance, if I want to serialize a list of integers, I can just say, give me a serializer for an integer, and then I'll figure it out how to serialize a list, stuff like that. So, so it's all cool, but it's not the, the main purpose of the talk. So how macros fit into that scheme? Well, uh, the, the good thing about type classes is extensibility, but the bad thing is that you actually have, have to write code. You actually have to provide the implicit instances. So here's how we did it before we had macros, right? So this is an example uh, from Play's documentation from, from an excellent post that, uh, that's called JSON Inception about how they integrated macros in 2.10 in, in, their, in their product. So you, you, just, uh, you just bite the bullet and you write the implicit instances yourself. So for instance, if you have 100 domain classes in your application, well, sure, you need to write 100 instances, right? Well, uh, there are some techniques to, to address this, this shortcoming. Some, some are based on reflection, some are based on advanced type level techniques, uh, but they, uh, they all have downsides. So for instance, if you use reflection, you lose performance, sure. And for, for some people, that might be unacceptable. Uh, but with macros that are good at generating code, we can actually write a macro that will generate stuff that you see here, here, automatically. So we can write this. So this reads, as I said, stuff in blue is macro. Okay, so this reads is a macro. It takes a type parameter, and since it executes at compile time, it, it knows the exact representation of the type parameter. So it's not like in, in normal Scala without macros, where you write a function and its type parameter gets erased. No, here is different. So when we, when we say json.reads of person, we actually get a representation of person, and then inside the macro we can, we can ask, okay, what, what members does this person have? And it will say, okay, it has a name, sure, and then we'll say, all right, let's, let's read the name from JSON, no problem. Well, and then, thanks to macros and thanks to, to them being able to use Reflection API at compile time, we can generate exactly the same code as we see here. So there's no catch, absolutely no catch. The code will, will be identical, the bytecode. And well, that's wonderful because we're going to have excellent performance, right? Uh, but still, there's a problem. If we have this 100 domain classes in our application, we have to write this implicit val equals JSON person blah, 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 and blah 100 times. Not very good. And it was not very good until we, we, we got implicit macros in 2.10.2. And here's the result. So it's like you don't need to write any code at all. So you just write a single implicit macro, and then every time any serializer or deserializer is necessary, well, it will be generated on the fly. And here's how it works. So uh, the, the key trick here is to put this, uh, is not in declaring this implicit macro, is in making it uh, convenient to work with. So uh, usually when you declare an implicit somewhere, you have to, to import it later, later on to use it. But here's a nice thing about uh, Scala implicits. We, we've discussed that uh, sometimes implicit resolution rules are a bit convoluted and stuff like that. But sometimes you really enjoy that. Because here you have this companion object, this companion object called, called reads. And by coincidence, implicit scope for reads of t, for instance, when, you, when we look up reads of int or reads of person, it includes the contents of the companion object. So we don't have to import anything at all. And that's why I said that we're not going to need any code. This, this implicit, it, it just, uh, yeah, it's, it, it is seen every time uh, an appropriate implicit instance is not declared. And then it will work like that. You just write from JSON of person without writing an implicit parameter, uh, an, impl an argument for an implicit parameter yourself. And then the compiler will see, okay, you haven't declared an implicit instance. Sure, you haven't because you don't have to anymore. That's wonderful. And then it will say, all right, then I'll go to the companion object, and wow, what do I see there? An implicit macro. And then it will just insert a call to an implicit macro, and the implicit macro will expand, producing the required deserializer. And this is, uh, this is quite an interesting technique, and uh, 
well, we've used it to, to great success in the Scala Pickling project. So may, maybe you've heard about Scala Pickling. There's a Scala Days talk about that. So to, to keep it short, it's, it's a really nice uh, serialization library for Scala that does a lot of things at compile time to, to achieve like, the best performance possible. And well, uh, so why I brought it up here is that we used implicit macros there to generate serializers, deserializers, and they were quite useful. And uh, so, some more details of uh, how to apply this technique can be found in my, my talk about applied materialization. So you can go to that link later. And it, it, it's quite interesting. So here I condensed it into a couple slides, but there it was like 50 or 60 slides with funny details. So I encourage you to take a look. And well, so speaking of alternatives, uh, what we can do, oh, yeah, one more nice thing about macros in general and about uh, implicit macros in particular is that uh, they perfectly integrate, integrate with existing uh, uh, features of Scala. So remember I said that implicits compose, so you can write an implicit that depends on another implicit. And well, macros uh, meld into this scheme excellently. So you can write an implicit that depends on the macro implicit without the former implicit even knowing what's going on. So here we have written a printer for, for a list that just takes printers uh, for, for, for elements and then uses them to, to do some stuff. And these printers, they might come from a macro and we won't even know that. So you can see uh, another, another reason why, why we have macros looking like normal functions. If they look like normal functions, they can be used in a lot of situations where normal functions can be used completely transparently for the user. We'll see quite a few examples of this technique later. And now the promised alternative that I wanted to show you, it's uh, how you can do this completely without macros. So some people prefer using type level techniques, advanced uh, type programming. Sure, that's possible. So th this is a thing that uh, Lars Huppel has been presenting uh, during the Scala workshop. Again, Scala workshop keeps coming up. Uh, you can go to the link and, and, and take a look at the slides for, for the details, but here I just outlined it, briefly outlined it. So apparently a lot of data structures that you work with, they can be reduced to case classes, just flat data types, right? And uh, speaking of case classes, abstract data types, we know that they conform to, well, they have nice properties. Essentially, they can be decomposed into, well, products and co-products. So essentially, you can view them as uh, a combination of tuples and ethers. So a case class is just a tuple of its fields, plus if we have a sealed hierarchy of case classes, then it will be either this or that or that. Like List is either a, a list or an, or a new, stuff like that. And then once you obtain this nice uniform representation for your data types, then with this function called project, you can, and uh, well, a small amount, uh, some amount of magic, uh, you, you can obtain uh, imp uh, implicit instances for, for any data type that you have in the program. So again, if you have uh, 100 uh, domain classes, that's not a problem. You, you won't have to, to write anything yourself. And uh, there's a nice twist to this scheme. It becomes better with macros. And in what way, I, I won't get into that. You can just take a look at uh, the slides. So just, uh, yeah, okay, never mind. And now, uh, now when we've seen how implicit macro, so just, just to recap uh, what we've seen so far, we've seen how macros can be used to, to generate code explicitly when we said specialized of something. Now we've seen how macros can be used to generate code implicitly when we just ask for it and they, then they do it for us without us even like lifting a finger. And this is the third technique that I want to present is uh, how macros can generate code globally. Well, that, that might be a trick, right? Because I, I told you before that it's, it's impossible for a macro to do some, something global to the application because they just rewrite, uh, they rewrite their arguments, their call to, to something local. And this is the technique that's, that we've hacked around during the, the last weekend. So, well, the, the best formula to get a talk is just go to Twitter and chat with people, seriously. I, I'm amazed how, how it works. So, type providers, right? As you might probably know, previously we wanted to implement type providers with type macros. 
And as some of you might know, type macros got ditched. They won't be in 2.11, and most likely they won't be in any Scala ever. But what do we do now? So here in F# -sharp we have really nice features. So for, for those who, who are not familiar with type providers, uh, we can connect to an external data source and then generate a strongly typed wrapper for it. Okay. So so here in our case we have a database. Uh, this this coffee's database that Stefan has been showing us uh, previously today, and we want uh, we don't we don't want to write these case classes that uh, he showed us before by hand. We want to have them automatically generated. And apparently F# -sharp gives us this way, uh, gives us a way to do this. So what can we do with uh, def macros? Well, since it's, it's all local, we can write this macro, no problem. We can write a macro that connects to a database. As I said, macros can do anything you wish. Uh, but we will be limited to local classes. So here's the best that we can have. Is this a failure? So does it mean that we won't, we won't be able to use these classes anywhere in our program? So well. The one of the typical use cases I would imagine probably would be declaring a database somewhere and then using its services somewhere in some other place in some different file, for example. So will we be able to see these classes or to use them in some meaningful way? What do you think? If you splice an expression right after new db. No, no, but, but but you cannot splice expressions after db. So that's that's the thing about def macros. They can only uh, do things locally. So you, you have a call to h2db, this, this function call, and we can replace it with something else. We, we cannot touch anything else in the program. So will we be able to use this meaningfully? Yeah, sure. It depends on how you define meaningfully. I mean, there's nothing to stop you from saying db dot i or db dot val that represents a table, but you're going to have some trouble uh, passing it on to generic code. Not well, anything that represents a db dot specific table. well, it's it's almost like that indeed. So, luckily enough, Scala has structural types and local classes. They they get erased to structural types. So here we go. If we if we actually run this in REPL, here's what we'll get. And see this type. It essentially gives us all the information that we need. And, and then we can say db dot coffees and do all this stuff. But the problem with structural types is that they use reflection, at least on JVM. Well, there, there were plans to use invoke dynamic, but well, there's a lot of stuff to do, and uh, this, this wasn't very high priority, so it still remains plans. And therefore, we will pay the price of reflective access every time we, for example, if we want to, to traverse the results of, of these coffees, uh, then every time we, we get a name of, the, of this coffee instance, we will pay a price. That's not good, right? And here's where another feature of Scala 2.10 comes to the scene. Dynamic, right? So maybe you've heard of dynamic. It's, it's been with us since 2.9. And well, it, it was under-documented, so it was uh, sort of retrofitted into Scala, into a SIP uh, in 2.10, and now it's a full-fledged feature. Yet, well, it, it requires a feature import, but anyway, it's, it's a non-experimental feature. So with dynamic, uh, if you have a class that extends dynamic, then uh, when, you, when you try to use any its members and it doesn't have such a member, uh, accesses to this, uh, uh, this field accesses or method calls, they will be written into calls to methods called select dynamic or apply dynamic or stuff like that. And well, th this is still not, not far from reflection if we use it naively. But if we use macros, and if we declare select dynamic and apply dynamic as macros, then we essentially can do reflection at compile time. Well, this, is just amount, this just amounts to static access. So if you write uh, coffee.name, it will be able to figure out that it needs to look up a field named name. And if you write coffee.foobar, it will say, I don't know, uh, coffee doesn't have a field named foobar. Because that's done by a macro, and macro can do arbitrary stuff. So it can ask uh, the database for a schema, and then it can, it can verify that we're referencing the, the field that we need. So that's all very good, but now we've lost uh, auto-completion because we, we don't declare any fields at all. But apparently, this, this is still not the end, and this is what we discovered this, this weekend. That's amazing, right? <laughs> you, you can declare all the fields of the classes that you generate as macros, and then this 
macrosity, or how do you call the, the property of a, of a method being macro, it sort of leaks into structural types. So structural types not only remember the signatures of the methods, but they remember whether the method were a macro or not. And then when you say coffee.name, it will actually invoke the macro, so there won't be any reflective uh, uh, penalty. That's on, on the one hand, so we don't lose performance. And on the other hand, we don't lose auto-completion because we still have these members, right? This, this is quite an interesting technique. But, well, since, since it relies on so many features playing in concert, I wouldn't recommend to use it in production right away. So, well, due to the reasons that you can understand. So we have just, uh, we have just seen how macros can be used in really unexpected uh, ways. And uh, to do these this sorts of things, I, I would uh, recommend to wait until real type providers. Uh, that will come with uh, macro notations. As uh, Stefan said, maybe in 2.12 we will deliver them. And these macro notations, they will be, be able to, to generate real types and real members without any structural tricks. All right. So I guess uh, this concludes the code generation part of the talk. And now we're getting into validation, static checks. So since macros run at compile time and they can do arbitrary stuff, some of this stuff might involve uh, validation, uh, proving that your code has some desired properties. Uh, this, uh, this was traditionally the responsibility of a type system, because, well, that's what types are for. But, well, if we have macros, why, why not do all the cool stuff, right? No problem. And uh, before I proceed, before I show the use cases that people, how people use macros to, to validate things, I should mention again that macros are, are local, at least those macros that we have in 2.10. And therefore, it's not possible to have a macro that magically verifies your entire program. No, sorry, not possible. It's only possible to verify the arguments of the macro or the code that uh, you're going to produce. And the first example, quite classic, is strongly typed strings. So typically strings are the antipode of being statically typed. You just write some stuff and then you, you, you treat it somehow and you make mistakes and you get exceptions like that. But no more, you, you, don't, have to, you don't have to suffer because you can have macros and you can have compile time errors if you do these nasty mistakes. So how does it work? Actually, it's, it's, it's really simple again. And now we integrate with another feature of Scala introduced in 2.10 called string interpolation. So here, we, we, uh, with string interpolation, it's essentially possible to declare extensible well, strings. So you have a string, and then you prepend some identifier to it, say s or f. And then this desugars into a call to a string context, uh, as you can see on the slide. And, and then this amounts to, to Scala call, uh, calling into, into your custom method that handles the string. And uh, this handler, it gets a uh, string partitioned for you. So if you splice it, dollar something inside the string, you will get the, the arguments and the static parts, sep uh, parts separated from each other. Well, that's quite cool. And it becomes even more cool when you have macros, because you can have all these things validated stati uh, statically. So, so here, if you see the percent %d specifier for, for a splice, you, you can just insert a type description that you're expecting an int. And therefore, if you accidentally pass a string there, well, sure, you'll get a type error. And the compiler, I want, I want to show you. Oops, it's not shown here. Never mind. And the compiler, uh, well, not the compiler, but your own macro that you wrote by yourself, it will be able to pinpoint the exact location of the error in the middle of the string. It will say, you cannot splice a strings here. So it's not like it will crash with some random error. It will actually produce legible error messages. So this is one, one of the good things about macros uh, that uh, unlike implicit techniques that can be used to do a lot of things that macros can do at compile time, implicits don't, don't generally have uh, good error messages. They just say, Compiler just tells you that it cannot find an instance of some implicit, and that's it. And well, in Scala 2.8, we get an annotation that, that can prettify this error message. But that's, that's still not enough. With, with macros, you can, you can display arbitrarily messages that uh, fit your domain and that uh, guide the programmer to fixing them. So now let's, let's see how it works. Uh, I, I'll just skip that. And let's proceed to, to type channels. 
So Akka, cool thing, but uh, unfortunately actors are untyped, and therefore it's quite easy to make errors. So who can spot an error on this slide? So it will crash at runtime. It will misbehave at runtime. Why? Why would it even compile? You have a, a command, command apply there, command switch instantiation with no parameter. Well, sure, but command is a, a command is a case class, and therefore it generates an object. So when you write command, it will use the object, the companion object of command. And that's actually the problem, because you're not expecting a companion object there. That just doesn't make any sense. So we would like to, to get rid of uh, these uh, kinds of errors. And that's what we can do in, uh, even in Scala 2.9 uh, or in 2.10 without macros. We can just write a type specification for an actor that specifies all the types, all, all requests and responses that it can handle. And well, then we have to invoke some magic from shapeless. We have to do h lists of h lists, and then we, ha we have to traverse them somehow. And then we, we can arrive at the conclusion that we have mismatching types. But as I said, th the, this, this, is, this is going to be a bit awkward, because complex type level computations with implicits are awkward. And that's going to produce illegible uh, type errors. That's not good. And uh, well, that's why once, uh, once macros have been introduced to Scala, uh, we've got uh, typed channels for ACA that makes use of macros to, to verify this statically. So uh, here, here I don't have the definition of a macro, but I can just tell you how it works. This, uh, this fancy symbol, symbolic operator, it, it's a macro that takes a type of the actor that it uh, applies to, takes the message, and then it can verify that everything works. And uh, what, what's even better, it, it can do more. So if, if you have a ping pong situation where you have one actor and another actor communicating with each other, you can verify that uh, this communication will be okay at every step. So imagine that the first actor accepts like two or three different messages and the second actor is also uh, quite diverse. And then you, with the macro you can verify that if the first uh, actor sends something to that one and that one replies in one of the possible ways, then that one will be able to reply, and that one will be able to reply, and well, you get the idea. This, this sorts of complex things can also be validated. Because, well, macros, they are just normal Scala functions, and they can do whatever you, you desire. And all that with uh, legible error messages. And uh, also, yeah, just one, one thing that came to my mind in, uh, in today's talk about how to use types in Scala for your benefit, it was mentioned that if you use advanced type level techniques, then your programs become slower. Not your programs, but compilation of your programs. That happens because uh, when you do type computations with implicits, you essentially do interpretation of some domain-specific language for type level domain-specific language. And the interpretation, it always, it's always slow. But with macros, you don't have to do that. You don't have to look up an implicit that depends on another implicit that depends on another implicit. And this chain can become huge if you, say, pro process complex uh, specifications of actors. You just, you just can have a single macro that's written in Scala. And therefore, it, it has uh, predictable performance guarantees. So you just see, oh, here's the piece of code that's executed when I want to validate my input. And well, it's just, it's just a simple loop. OK, what, what, can, be, uh, what can be easier? Especially if it's written in Scala, if it's compiled to bytecode, but not interpreted. So that's, that's another good thing about macros, is that they can simplify that level of programming. And now let's see another example of uh, how people can use uh, validation of macros in a creative way. So here, here we have actors again. And here we have actors mixed with futures. And inside of, uh, inside of a future, we capture sender, which represents, well, a sender of the message that's been sent to actor. But Unluckily for us, this sender is not a value, so it's not a val. It's a def, and this def, it, it, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not referentially transparent, so it uses some mutable state. At, and it can happen so that this future will be executed. When, when the future is executed, this mutable state will be gone. I mean, another message will arrive from possibly a different sender. And therefore, well, this sender will return our own result because it, it, will, it will get the current sender, uh, currently uh, the one that's being processed. And well, that, that's a problem, sure. 
And here's how we can verify that these situations don't happen if we use macros. So we just define a spore macro, and we say that futures must take spores, not normal functions. And since spore is a macro, it can do whatever you want at compile time. It can take a look at the code, at its argument, and it can verify that it doesn't uh, capture undesired variables. If it does, we, we report a compiler error, again, in a legible way. So we can say precisely, we can point precisely at that position where we have sender and say, no, this is not going to work. So of course, you, you must be thinking now, that's all very cool, and they even have a SIP for that, right? But it's, it's, it's a lot of code to write. Every time you have to write spore of uh, curly braces and stuff, right? Yeah. Uh, but actually, it's, it's better than that. We've seen implicit macros, and we can see how they can help here. So futures, in, in our example, futures can still take spores as arguments, but then you will, ha will have an implicit conversion that converts any body, any by name argument, converts it to a spore. And this macro will do all the validation that we needed. And as a result, the user, you, will, you will write a library that uses spores. So it makes sure that the closures that you capture, they are good. And then users won't even know about that. They will just get compilation errors if, if they do something bad. Seems, seems quite good. Well, uh, here we go to, to the last part of the talk, DSLs. So Scala, Scala does an excellent job in the DSL department right now. So why, why do we even need macros for that? So what, what DSLs amount to? Well, at least uh, we can view them in one of the possible ways, is that you write a program in some, in some language that's different from Scala, and it can be embedded into Scala, if you wish. So it can be, it, it can look like Scala. And then you, you treat this program as a data structure, essentially. So you, you have this program, and then you, you can interpret it yourself, for example. Uh, th this, also, uh, this all sounds ha hand wavy, but it uh, more or less makes sense. So ev even if you define a, an embedded DSL with a bunch of functions that take by name parameters, for instance, it, it all amounts to, to specially handling this, uh, this function invocations. So if you have a function, I don't know, if you have a couple of functions, this amounts to having a special language that consists just of uh, a couple of operators, and then you treat them, well, special. And macros can help with that. Uh, here's, here's what I have in mind. Well, that's, that, uh, let's see how, how one uh, can, can write, uh, uh, can communicate with databases right now. So first of all, you can write SQL. And this SQL doesn't have to be unsafe. You can validate it at compile time, as Stefan mentioned before. So this is one way of doing that. This is, this is sort of a DSL as well. It's an external DSL, it's just SQL, right? You can do it differently. You can write it as if it, uh, as if it were Scala 2.9. You can use an embedded DSL, and then you would have to work around some words of uh, Scala. So as Stefan mentioned, you cannot use equals equals in your DSL. You have to use equals equals equals, and stuff like that. So Scala is very good at uh, embedded DSLs. Therefore, these uh, rough edges, they, they will be, they, there won't be much of them, but there will be some. And uh, you can also do this. So you, you, can, uh, you can write normal Scala functions. And then you, you can have uh, their bodies. Uh, you, you can treat their bodies as data structures. So what do I mean by data structures? I mean this. Well, with macros, we can already treat code like data structure, like, well, an abstract syntax tree. And here, we, we, just, we just make use of that to, to design a so-called deeply embedded domain-specific language. So in this particular case, we have a filter macro that just takes a predicate and transforms it into our, I don't know, our uh, query. So from, from what I understand, in, in Slick, it works somewhat similarly. And well, that's it. You, you can use this power to write arbitrary DSLs and uh, then have them embedded into Scala. Uh, those of you who are familiar with other developments from EPFL might ask a question. How does this differ from Scala virtualized or LMS or staging in general? So here's another way of uh, achieving exactly the same thing with deep embedding. It's, uh, it's sort of depicted on, on this printout. 
instead of operating with uh, normal values, t's, you can wrap them into wraps, wrap of t. So as we've seen here today on the presentation about uh, slick, one of the ways to, to use slick is, is to use a lifted embedding, where you have to declare a table descriptor. And this table descriptor will contain information about columns. So if you have a coffee with, an, uh, with a name which is a string, you have to write a val name equals some column of string. Well, I don't know the exact syntax, so I hope Stefan will forgive me, but it all amounts to, to, to having a name type not as string, but as column of string. And then, if, if you have this indirection, if you, if you can have this indirection of wrap of t, then using implicits and some other techniques, uh, you can essentially do the same uh, as macros did. So for, for every invocation of a method, for, for every invocation know, of equals, plus, of even field access, you, you can all sort of virtualize this and get exactly the same re representation that we had in macros. And it can, what's, what's even better, it can be domain specific, so you can immediately apply domain specific optimizations to it. And this technique is called LMS, lightweight modular staging, and it has been used to great success in a lot of research projects. So what's, what's the catch here? How does this compare with uh, macros? Well, the first thing is that you actually have to write reps of t to make this all work. Whereas in, in, in macros, you just write normal Scala code, and you don't worry about that. The second thing is that currently LMS requires a special Scala compiler called Scala Virtualized, so it, it's, it, which, which is different from the production compiler that you use. And uh, this, this, uh, this is still a trade-off, because with macros, you cannot get this level of composability. What do I mean? Well, here in this example, let's see how we, how we modularize our queries. It all works fine if we write a query totally inside of one expression, like, like in the example before on the slide here at the top. But if you want to, to move this expression into a function uh, that says is affordable here, but then the macro that tries to virtualize this, it will only see identifier called is affordable. It, it won't have a clue what, what this function expands to, what it amounts to. As I said, macros are only local currently. So they cannot look past uh, their arguments. They can only look inside. They can only do local transformations. And that's the problem that uh, people are working on. So you, you can, uh, and probably there will be some results eventually. Yeah, okay. So uh, I will just uh, quickly show another example of how you can use macros for DSLs. And this is uh, the Scala async thing that greatly simplifies work in uh, asynchronous programming. So this is the typical way of how you do asynchronous programming right now in Scala. So you use features. Features nicely compose uh, with this nice monadic syntax. You can use four comprehensor comprehensions for them, but it's still tricky. So here we have uh, sequential control flow, linear control flow. It's, it's more or less manageable. Although still there's some garbage here, like tem tem temporary variable name, stuff like that. But if you, ha if you have complex control flow, this, this becomes unbearable. So you need to, to essentially transform your program into a different style, into a different mental style that's harder to understand, uh, but that allows a uh, compiler to, to, do, to do some stuff. Uh, well, to, to do callbacks, essentially. But uh, when we hear the words transformation and tough, well, you naturally think about macros, right? And here's, uh, here's what uh, our TypeSafe team has come up with, which is uh, somehow related to, to what they've been doing in C Sharp. We just have this async and await macros that do the transformation for you. So you, you write in, in normal syntax that you would write synchronous computations in, and you just mark the, the fragments that are supposed to be asynchronous. And then all the magic happens behind the scenes. And it all works. So just to summarize what we have seen today, macros in 2.10, they are already vastly useful. People have been using them for quite a long time. And we've seen how they interact with a lot of Scala features. We've covered at least uh, se seven different SIPs today without even noticing that. And uh, well, bottom line is that you can tap into that power as well. And it's possible right now with the 2.10.2 compiler which is already available and that you can use instead of 2.10.x, any series. And it all boils down to code generation, static verification of code, and DSLs. If your use case falls uh, into one of these categories, then maybe macros are a good idea. Thanks. <laughs>